This is CNN, a network of Turner Broadcasting System. CNN Sports brings you the Grand Dame Slam as tennis crowns a teenage queen in Queens. But can another long-haired blonde teenager take the biggest step of his career? Avon Lendl doesn't want to hear about it. In the Rose Bowl, a phony night for the Huskers. Along with the highs and lows of college football, Clemens conquers his Kareen, and the Tigers get ready to throw in the towel. This is CNN Sports Late Night with Gary Miller and Dan Patrick. Hello and welcome to the show, along with Gary Miller, I'm Dan Patrick on a day when everything was grand at the U.S. Open, but the same cannot be said for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. It was UCLA putting the grand slam on the second-ranked team in the country. This is a bit of a stunner. The Hurricanes on hiatus, Miami had the night off, so who would be number two? With the Hurricanes off and holding on to number one, this evening in Los Angeles, the prince of the polls was played for, second-ranked Nebraska hosting number three UCLA. While the Cornhuskers, UCLA was hosting Nebraska, the Cornhuskers coming in at 2-0. and The also unbeaten Bruins came in in a bad mood. The last three times they met, Nebraska had won and scored exactly 42 points each time. In front of 84,000 in the Rose Bowl, Terry Donahue ready to finally get a win against the Cornhuskers. Troy Aikman going back, spotting tight end Charles Arbuckle, who weaves his way through the entire secondary. Their first set from scrimmage, and he goes 70 yards. Bruins lead 7-0. Now on the punt return, it's the expert, Daryl Henley, who last week ran one back for a score. This time, he covers 75 yards. The Cornhuskers were down 28 to nothing at the end of the first quarter. The Bruins never looked back. Aikman was brilliant tonight, threw for three scores. In the second quarter, he finds David Keating. He was 13 of 22 on the night for 205 yards. In two games, he's 26 of 39. And Nebraska gets humbled 41 to 28. UCLA's 41 point explosion, the most ever against the Tom Osborne team, and the most against Nebraska in 20 years. And it was also poetic justice for Terry Donahue, who was the victim of Osborne's 100th coaching victory. He returned the favor Saturday night. The team most expect UCLA to face in a showdown for the Pac 10 title two months from now. Southern Cal narrowly avoided its first loss to Stanford in 13 years. The sixth-ranked Trojans trailed until the final minute when Rodney Peet directed the decisive 80-yard drive to win their conference opener. Dan? Michigan and Notre Dame, two great coaches, two great traditions, combining to give us one great game Saturday night. These two have met eight times in the last 10 years, with both teams winning four apiece. In the history of major college football, Michigan has won more games than any other team. Second on that list, Notre Dame. Notre Dame trying to replace Heisman Trophy winner Tim Brown. And Ricky Waters back to return the punt. And uh, Tim Brown, well, if he was watching, probably thought that he was seeing himself on a highlight reel because Waters goes 81 yards, staking Notre Dame to a 7-0 lead. This is less than five minutes into the game. Notre Dame led it 13 to 7 in the fourth quarter when Waters trying again. This time he fumbles. Michigan recovers and from there, Bo Schembechler looking on. Is Michael Taylor fourth and one at the one? The naked bootlegs. Notre Dame caught with their pants down. 14-13 Michigan. Fourth quarter, a minute 13 to go. Reggie Ho, a walk on from Hawaii. His fourth field goal of the evening. 1917 Notre Dame. Three seconds left. Mike Gillette from 48 yards. He had earlier kicked a 49 yarder. This one is short and to the right. And Notre Dame comes up big by the final of 19 to 17. And it's doubtful Michigan is going ho, ho, ho after watching Reggie Ho come up with four big, big field goals. And for Bo Beckler, he suffered his second consecutive opening day loss. Florida State went looking for a victim and found one in Southern Miss. Seminoles leading 7-0 in the first period. Chip Ferguson, a 22-yard score to Dexter Carter. Ferguson, 12 of 17, 239 yards. Florida State led it 14 nothing. Ferguson wasn't through. To Lawrence Dossey, had two catches on the evening, both for touchdowns. This one, 93 yards, the third longest reception in Florida State history. 
You kind of get the gist of how this one went. It was 21-0 at the time. Florida State coasting to the 49-13 victory. For the second straight year, Florida State has taken out its frustrations on Southern Miss after losing the opener to Miami. Sammy Smith, who gained over 1,200 yards last year, rushed for only 42 on the night. That gives him 48 on the year. With a look at some of the bigger games of the afternoon, here's CNN's John Fricke. Michigan State, the defending Rose Bowl champions, opened at home. And guess what? The Spartans were stunned by Rutgers. The Scarlet Knights jumped on top 17-3 by halftime, held off a furious Spartan rally. Rutgers win 17-13, and Michigan State will drop from the rankings. And for the Spartans, their next two games are Notre Dame and Florida State. The Big Ten finally got a needed dose of good news after all the upsets. Ohio State shot out of the blocks in game number one under new coach John Cooper. The Buckeyes dominated Syracuse from the second quarter on, winning 26-9, ushering in a new era, and by the way, snapping the Orangemen's unbeaten streak. Fourth-ranked Oklahoma had Jamel Holloway back at the helm, but it was backup quarterback Charles Thompson who broke the game open in North Carolina. This touchdown propelled the Sooners to a 14-0 lead early on the Tar Heels. The Sooners were never pressed, winning their opener with ease. Clemson's now 2-0. The fifth-rated Tigers won, but struggled, beating Division I AA Furman 23-3. In Auburn, the Tigers opened with a pesky set of cats from Kentucky. James Joseph broke the ice with this leaping touchdown as the War Eagles looked to have things in control, but Kentucky wouldn't give in, and the Wildcats cut the lead to seven points late, had a chance to tie, but literally threw it away with late-game turnovers, and Auburn holds on 20-10. to Georgia's now 2-0. It ran rough shot over TCU. The Bulldogs chalked up nearly 500 yards in offense and even threw a halfback TD pass in routing the Horde Frogs 38-10. West Virginia had another walk. The untested Mountaineers 2-0, blowing out Fullerton State 45-10. Calvin Phillips had 190 yards receiving for West Virginia. At a Ross Age Stadium, Fred Akers and Purdue gave 16th-ranked Washington fits, but the Huskies rode Aaron Jenkins 162 yards rushing and a stingy defense to an opening day 20-6 victory. In Fayetteville, Tulsa quarterback T.J. Rubley was both hero and goat. Rubley drew for 380 yards and three touchdowns as Tulsa pushed 22nd-ranked Arkansas to the limit. The Razorbacks grabbed the lead late on this 13-yard TD run by James Rouse, but still Rubley had a chance to pull off the upset in the closing moments, but fumbled deep in hog territory, and Arkansas escaped 30-26. to And Iowa, back in the win column, 45-10 over K-State, the Hawkeyes last. The two touchdowns came on interception returns, both over 81 yards. An easy win, yes, but still, believe this, the vaunted Hawkeyes were outgained in yardage by the Big 8 doormats. I'm John for DCNN Sports. Virginia hosted 19th-ranked Penn State, and Blair Thomas, last year's leading rusher for Penn State, possibly out for the year. First quarter without Thomas, it is Tom Bill hitting Michael Timpson for a five-yard score, 21-0 Penn State. Second quarter, the rushing load shared by many, but Jerry Brown, the niftiest run of the night, 20 yards, his second touchdown of the evening, and Penn State led Virginia 28-7, and Penn State coast to the 42-14 victory over George Welch's squad. They were calling this the biggest game in the history of Virginia, at least on the Virginia campus. Gary Brown, seven carries, 38 yards, two touchdowns rushing, one receiving. The Lions' Sam Gash also ran for a couple of scores. Alabama and Temple. It was a big, big win for Alabama. Heisman hopeful Bobby Humphrey ran for 91 yards. Gene Jelks returned to kick off 96 yards for a score. The Owls shut out for the first time in five years. One of the bigger surprises ranks up there with Michigan State's loss. Duke over Tennessee at Tennessee. Fifth-year senior Anthony Dillwig threw three touchdowns to Clarkston Hines as the Blue Devils improved to 2-0. A lot of people felt Tennessee was looking ahead to next week's game with LSU. Miami of Ohio led 3-0, lost 52-20. Barry Sanders, the man replacing Thurman Thomas in the backfield, put up some numbers Thomas would be proud of. Sanders rushed for 178 yards, three touchdowns, returned to kickoff 100 yards. And Florida over Mississippi. A conference game, Emmett Smith ran for 109 yards. Stacey Simmons returned the second-half kickoff 85 yards for a score. Next week, the Gators will play Indiana State. Speaking of teams not worth trumpeting much, New Mexico played New Mexico State. Wait, Somebody, wait, wait, wait a minute, who? We're not trumpeting the Florida Sycamores. State. Okay, all right. We're, they we're played Montana Florida. State earlier. Okay, but they'll probably win. Anyhow, New Mexico playing New Mexico State. Two teams in trouble. Mike Shepard's team wins it by two. 
First time he'd won there, he got carried off the field. We'll get carried away <laughs> with the Grand Slam of tennis next. We get there with scores outside the rankings. <laughs> Sometimes, after a big lunch, a day at the park is a little too much for Tommy Lasorda. So he reaches for relief, Rolaids, and acid for millions. Nothing, absolutely nothing, works better for heartburn and acid indigestion. And why should heartburn take the fun out of the game? Get relief. You know how to spell it. Welcome back to CNN Sports Late Night, and I think it's time to dust off some of the adjectives we used to describe Martina Navratilova a few years ago. Saturday afternoon, Steffi Graf slammed the door on one of the greatest years in the history of tennis. Coming into her match with Gabriella Sabatini, the 19-year-old Graf had lost just twice in 61 matches. She was a win away from joining the rather elite group of Margaret Court, Maureen Connolly, Don Budge, and Rod Laver, past winners of tennis's Grand Slam. For Steffi, she was trying to become the second youngest woman to win the U.S. Open. Tracy Austin won it when she was 16. Graf, who is 19, won the first set 6-3. Both of Steffi's defeats this year delivered by Gabriela Sabatini, the 18-year-old Argentinian, won the second set 6-3 as her father cheered on. In the third set, Graf comes back with her lethal weapon, the forehand. And Sabatini was helpless in watching as Graf's father looking on match point and Sabatini can't return Steffi's backhand in an hour and 41 minutes Graf is indeed grand she wins at 6-3 3-6-6-1 she's now won nine tournaments this year her streak of consecutive wins climbs to 34 and she spoke with CNN's Tom Kirkland following her historic victory it's a big relief isn't it I mean all the pressure building up to the US Open they said this would be the most difficult yeah, that's true. Everybody was saying that, and uh, everybody was saying also that I'm going to win it. You know, were, everybody was so sure suddenly, and saying only if she can break a leg or anything. And that made me, maybe today, I could feel the first time a little bit the pressure. And so I'm very happy to have that talk over about the Grand Slam and just can enjoy the next couple months. Nothing as momentous as a Grand Slam at stake on the men's side, but Yvonne Lunda was looking to lengthen his legendary status in the Open. As the three-time defending champion faced adolescent Andre Agassi, he was attempting to reach the finals a record seventh straight time. Agassi had made some noise in the quarters with his comments after crushing Jimmy Connors. But Lenda was more upset with the teenager's on-court oratory in Saturday's semis. And he was also dismayed at Agassi's play, the youngest man ever in the semis of the Open, and Agassi taking it to the defending champion, the backhand winner. He takes the first set, 6-4. But Lenda upset and his grunting and screaming with his winning shots took it up with the judges, and they decided to just play it out, Yvonne, and play he did. Here serving in the far court, he had six aces by the end of the second set, which he took back 6-2. Now in the third set, Agassi battling back, and both players cover all the court. In this brilliant exchange, Lendo comes to the net, and a lob winner perfectly placed. Agassi was within a point, but Lendl stiffened from there, went back to his power game, 
and overmatched the man 10 years his junior. And everyone was wide-eyed at the open, expecting the inevitable. As Lendl just put on a demonstration from there, breezed through the last three sets, 6-2, 6-3, 6-4, and has now won 27 straight U.S. Open matches and shoots for his seventh straight final and record fourth in a row on Sunday. It is the, and he also snapped Agassi's 23-match winning streak in the process. You know, it's good to win, but uh, we have to keep it in perspective. I didn't come here to beat Agassi. I came here to try to win the tournament. So, you know, for the moment, it's very satisfying. But if I lose tomorrow, I will be very disappointed. I was disappointed in my efforts today. I don't know. I just didn't feel like I, like I did against Jimmy or against Chang or against anybody else. I just didn't feel it inside. Overall performance for the tournament, I think it's done a lot for me. Second seed Mats Wielander moved into position for a battle for the number one ranking in the world by straight setting the lowest seed ever to reach the Open semis, Australian Darren Cahill, the lowest ranked player. Last September, the Swede lost to his Connecticut neighbor, Yvonne Lendl, in the finals of the Open, and at the Masters in French, also finals matchups. CBS will carry the climax of the tennis season Sunday afternoon. Lendl with a 13-6 lifetime record against Wielander, including the last six straight. All the diamond doings, including Detroit's deepening nosedive, after this. This U.S. Open update brought to you by Subaru. We built our reputation by building a better car. And I don't want anyone driving my XT while I'm away. Do you understand? The new Subaru XT6 has a powerful six-cylinder engine, computerized full-time four-wheel drive, and a design which makes it hard to resist. Somebody drove my car. Who was it? La, 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 bam, ba, da, da, ba. Up to $1,000 cash back from Subaru means a great deal on a great car. McDonald's invites you to be part of the U.S. Olympic team. He needs a perfect 10. When you play McDonald's when the U.S. wins, you win Olympic game. He approaches the handstand. When the U.S. wins a medal in the event on your game piece, you win too. Win a Big Mac, regular fries, or medium soft drink. Or you could instantly win Reebok sports gear or an RCA big screen television. He did it! And you can too, because when the U.S. wins, you win. The good time, great taste of McDonald's. Checking channels? Check CNN to find out what in the world is going on. CNN, stay informed. Welcome back to CNN Sports Late Night, where fans in Fenway Park were wondering when Roger Clemens would be back to his old self. Once an odds-on favorite for his third straight Cy Young Award, the Red Sox ace hadn't won since the last day of July, as Boston hosted the Indians in the midst of a 10-game homestand, and fans... About halfway in. ...fueling the Rockets' return, off and he did a little bit himself. Here, diving off the mound, getting the play on Mel Hall. He had a no-hitter into the eighth inning. When with one out, Dave Clark, who had earlier walked to break up his perfect game, gets the only hit of the game. How did Clemens react? Well, he got a standing ovation, and that was the only hit he gave up. He struck out the next two batters. Five on the day, 269 in the year. That leads the majors. Dwight Evans gave him all the help he needed from the plate. Hits this one to the deepest part of the park. Evans was four for four. He has now reached base 11 straight times, including this two-run triple. Clemens wins it 6-0. He's now 9-0 in his career against Cleveland. It's his eighth shutout of the year. Boston's won 5 of 6. More pressure on the teams trailing them. Top of the fifth at Yankee Stadium. Rick Roden tied at two, facing Scott Lucader, and he gets one up, and Lucader hits a rope into the right field bleachers. Tigers take a 4-2 lead. Lou Pinella changes his gum, but he stayed with his pitcher and tried to get some offense against Jack Morris. They load the bases, and then Don Slott, who was 4 for 5, hits one of two doubles on the day. The Yankees come from 4-3 down to take a 5-4 lead and add four more. They were up 9-4 in the ninth. Roden going to close it out and getting a brilliant defensive play from Mike Pagliarulo, who robs Billy Bean. Roden shuts the door, and the Yanks win it 9-4. They're 3 and a half. Uh, the Tigers are three and a half back. They've lost 16 of 19. Yanks stay four and a half out. Milwaukee trying to stay within five and a half with this effort 
by Rob Deere. Alvin Davis going for the long ball when Deere goes up and over the wall and takes away a home run. It was a shutout game until the third when Teddy Higuera faces Darnell Coles, who hits a shot up the middle. Mickey Brantley off and running scores easily. It would prove to be the only run of the game. Eric Hansen, the rookie, combines in a shutout with Mike Schooler, and the Brewers fall five and a half out. At Memorial Stadium, the Orioles erupted for six in the fifth in a battle of the birds, dropping the Blue Jays seven and a half back. At Royal Stadium, Charlie Liebrandt beat Oakland for the sixth straight time, but Jose Canseco now has 113 RBIs. He's two shy in homers and four in steals of the 40-40 club. At Comiskey Park, Carlton Fisk's 300th career home run brings him six shy of Yogi Berra for the all-time record in the American League for catchers. Jeff Reardon gave it up in the ninth. That spoiled Frank Viola's bid for his 22nd win. Gene Larkin, with an RBI double, made a winner of Mark Portugal. At Arlington, a marathon that ended after 2 a.m. Eastern. Ruben Sierra's single over a pulled-in outfield off Rick Monteleone finally ended it in the 17th. Well, it looks to be a three-man race for the National League Cy Young Award. The Reds' 21-game winner, Danny Jackson. The Mets' 16-game winner, David Cohn. And the Dodgers' Oral Hershiser. Well, Saturday night, Hershiser went after his 20th victory of the year, a plateau the right-hander had never reached in his five-year career. Well, you guessed it. Hershiser comes through dramatic fashion. His fourth straight complete game, his 12th of the season. It was also his fifth shutout in 1988. It was Rick Dempsey providing all the offense Hershiser needed, and picking up his 20th victory. The Giants are underdogs in the West, trailing L.A. by nine games. 2-1 Giants, bottom of the fifth. Buddy Bell, the nice stop on Robbie Thompson. And it was still 2-1. We went to the seventh, when Gerald Young will change that. As he doubles down the line, bringing in Rafael Ramirez, tying the game at two apiece. We went to the bottom of the seventh. Donnell Nixon on second. Jose Uribe with the bleeder up the middle. Ramirez can't make the play. You're not going to catch Nixon at home. The Giants led it 3-2 and made that one hold up for the victory. The Giants' third win in their last 16 games. Will Clark drove in his 98th run of the season, tops in the National League. To Montreal, where David Cohn was putting the locals to sleep. Pascual Perez nodding off. So were the Expos bats. Cone, 10 strikeouts. Here getting Tim Wallach on the backward K. Yes, the cone heads were out, but kind of silent. Keith Hernandez bat, though, came alive in the ninth inning off Tim Burke. And Hernandez, his 10th home run of the season, staking New York to a five-zip lead. More than enough for Cone. They went on to win it by the final of six to nothing. Cone shut out his fourth of the year and the 21st for the Mets staff. It was the Pirates over the Phils. Dave LaPointe, what a pickup he's been. Too bad Pittsburgh's out of the race. He won for the seventh straight time. The Pirates still nine back. Chicago and St. Louis, Scott Terry won for the sixth straight time. Cards won for the sixth consecutive time. Padres over the Braves. Eric Shaw took a one-hitter into the ninth before settling with a three-hitter. Shaw went the distance for his 11th complete game. Rob Deere's classy catch was our play of the day on the earlier broadcast and still clearly the most outstanding individual effort. But when we can honor a fan for athletic achievement, we always endeavor to give the amateurs their due. And let's go to the professionals first in San Diego. Gerald Perry on his way to a batting crown, but not a gold glove. Joe Baver pitching to Benito Santiago, and look out, at least he's smart enough not to get hit. But on the next foul ball, Still Baber against Santiago, and keep your eye on the vendor. Basket catch. That's one souvenir he won't sell at any price. Just sign it. Play of the day. Play of the day, brought to you by Budweiser. Beachwood aids for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. There's a clean, crisp, ice cold, beechwood aged Budweiser with your name. There are some grips you can't do anything about. 
But you won't have to worry about drips again if you own a mowing faucet. Because of our exclusive washerless cartridge, mowing faucets last a lifetime. That's why we give them a lifetime limited warranty against leaks and drips. So you won't be bothered by drips again. Hey, is that a faucet or what? Mowing faucets for a lifetime. Arnie Palmer, 18th hole for the win. Excuse me, Mr. Palmer, is it true about Arnie's caddy giveaway? Pennzoil's really giving away 50 new 89 Cadillac sedan to Vils? Yeah, 50. Wow. I guess to win a Cadillac, I just mail an entry form some quality Pennzoil motor oil. Ooh, sorry. Pennzoil's giving away 50 Cadillacs. 50? Arnie's caddy giveaway. Enter today. Time enough left to tell you that Ken Green had a 61 at the Greater Milwaukee Open. He's got a two-shot lead. NFL tomorrow. It'll be the 49ers playing the Giants, and the big news is Joe Montana or Steve Young. Montana's injured, but they won't decide until game time. It may not matter either way. Young's been moving the team, and uh, he's put some pressure on Montana. Should be the best matchup of the day. That's our time for now. I'm Gary Miller. I'm Dan Patrick. The news continues here on CNN.